Uh, uh, first year lawyer, or no, I guess the uh, 35, 30, uh, and uh, has handled uh, Maritime uh, Jones Act, uh, semen cases uh, throughout that whole 30 years, and is uh, well known and well respected in that area, which is really a niche, dealing with uh, federal courts and federal law and uh, federal corporations and foreign corporations, federal corporations, foreign corporations. And it's an area that you really, really, really have to know what you're doing. And uh, uh, Rick has proven himself to kind of be the dean of maritime stuff here in Houston. And I mentioned earlier his work for eight years with the uh, Harris County uh, Community College and uh, really got that place in good shape. Uh, I'm sorry that it's not still there. Uh, but he's going to talk about uh, what you need to know, the recent law, the difficulties in handling maritime. Uh, Rick's the type of guy that if you have a case or a question about it and want to know something about that area of the law, will be more than happy to talk with you, meet with you, etc. So, uh, Richard Schechter. Bob, thanks very much. I'm going to take off my watch and put it down here to give the pretense of being bound by time. Okay, so anybody here know what a maritime case is? Anybody handle maritime cases? Anybody have any exposure to maritime law when you were in uh, law school? All right, so we have some people. So basically what I'm going to try to do in 30 minutes is teach you what they do or teach you a chunk of what they teach you in a semester in law school and update you on the maritime law. So, in the United States, maritime law is in, uh, ingrained in the Constitution. There's a provision of the Constitution granting federal courts jurisdiction over admiralty and maritime cases. We inherited that from England where they had a separate admiralty set of courts. The Constitution does not define what admiralty and maritime law is and as a consequence there was a series of there have been a series of cases defining exactly what constitutes an admiralty and maritime case. Because it is constitutional law that establishes there's admiralty and maritime jurisdiction, admiralty and maritime law, when it applies, preempts state law. If admiralty and maritime law applies, state law does not apply. So, for tort cases, it's different than for contract cases. For tort cases, maritime jurisdiction is established when you have three things. One is locality, either the incident occurs on navigable waters or the incident occurs on land but is caused by something that happens on navigable waters. It bears a significant relationship to traditional maritime activity and it has a potential disruption of commerce. Those, uh, the case law that defines those, uh, I've cited in this little handout under Admiralty and Maritime Jurisdiction. If you want to read the cases, you're welcome to. As, all, as, in the, as you'll find throughout Admiralty and Maritime Law, the theories tend to be defined by the cases that present the most difficult issues. For example, tort maritime jurisdiction was established by a case where there was a collision on a very tiny river in Louisiana between a drunk Cajun operating a bass boat and a drunk Cajun operating a skiing boat. But that, that case has, as the Supreme Court, for some reason in the maritime area, they, instead of treating it like typical common law, which is you treat a case point by point, and over the years, the different points define the boundary, they like to come up with a grand theory, a grand schema, based on the most farthest out case possible. And that tends to cause problems, but hey, when you're on the United States Supreme Court, you got four Harvard or Yale law clerks there, why not spend your time thinking about those things? So, in the past year, you've had uh, several developments that are incredibly important in the maritime law. The first is, 
on the question of what is a vessel. And what is a vessel is important because whether there's a vessel generally determines your status in the case. That is, what law you're able to sue under. For example, if you want to sue under the Jones Act, which allows a seaman to sue his employer for negligence, there's no workers' compensation bar, just like the railroad workers under the FELA, you have to, in order to qualify as a seaman, have a connection to a vessel or an identifiable fleet of vessels. So the law in the United States was unclear about what constituted a vessel. And in 2005, the Supreme Court took this case called Stewart versus Dutra Construction uh, involving the Super Scoop. And this is the Super Scoop. And at the time, the Super Scoop was being used in Boston Harbor to dig the big trench, what's now the Ted Williams Tunnel that goes under the harbor. The Super Scoop had no ability to maneuver, had no basic self-propulsion ability. It carried the, the crane itself. It was pushed by a tugboat out to where it needed to dig. It dug where it needed to dig, and it could maneuver itself a certain number of feet based on using its lines and cables. So the question came to the Supreme Court, is that a vessel? The First Circuit up in Boston had a general rule, which is you can't be a vessel unless your structure is used primarily for transportation of people or cargo. That was different than the rule in the Fifth Circuit. So any guesses? Super scoop, vessel or not a vessel? Everybody thinks it's a vessel, raise your hand. Everybody thinks it's not a vessel, raise your hand. Very good, those of you who thought it was a vessel, you win. Supreme Court decides 9-0, the super scoop is a vessel. And it relies on the Rules of Construction Act, which define a vessel as every description of watercraft or other artificial contrivance used or capable of being used as a means of transportation on water. The super scoop was capable of being used as a means for transportation on water. It was used, in fact, much like a barge, so the court holds that it is a vessel. And the court held as long as you met the definition of vessel, it didn't make any difference whether the primary purpose of the vessel was transportation or what the vessel was doing at the moment of the injury. As long as it was capable of transportation, you qualified as a vessel. And as we'll see, this becomes very important for those of us here in Texas. Okay, now there had been a number of cases out of the Fifth Circuit trying to define what a vessel is, and Judge John Brown, who was former chief judge of the Fifth Circuit and generally considered one of the leading admiralty scholars in the history of uh, American jurisprudence, wrote that no doubt three men in a tub would also fit within our definition of what a vessel is, and one could probably make a convincing case for Joan inside the whale. And this disturbed Justice Breyer. And during the 2005 argument on the Stewart versus Dutra construction case, Justice Breyer mused, and of course Supreme Court justices like to muse, and he mused, well, it seems to me that you could have a garage door that was blown off in a hurricane and is floating in the water, and that would constitute uh, a boat. Okay, so, how many of you have seen Sleepless in Seattle? All right, great Tom Hanks, Meg Ryan movie. And Tom Hanks, you may remember, was the young architect who lived in this structure. And this is a photo of the structure in Seattle. It's floating on the river. Boat or no boat? Everybody who thinks it's a vessel, raise your hand. Everybody thinks it's not a vessel, raise your hand. Okay, so if you own that structure and it's a boat and you employ a cleaning lady who comes to your house every day, she becomes a member of the crew of your vessel and she doesn't get comp, she gets to sue you for negligence if you're in, she's injured in your home. So, sure enough, wouldn't you know it, in 2013, this case gets to the Supreme Court involving this structure. Lozman versus City of Riviera Beach, Florida. Now, the story behind the Lozman case is just too rich not to tell you. Fane Lozman is a former Marine Corps officer and he was a quote unquote financial trader. And so one day, Mr. Lozman is around Fort Myers Beach, Florida, and he sees this structure. It has been obviously home built, it has been 
on the, on the bank of a river in that area and it hasn't moved for 26 years. And Lozman goes, I want to live in that. So he pays the owner $17,000. He's now going to live on his, what do we call that structure, a houseboat? He's now going to live on his houseboat. So, but he doesn't want to live in Fort Myers Beach, Florida. He wants to live in Miami. So he hires a towing company, and this is the tow, and they tow the boat down to Miami, 200 miles. Now, Lozman is a guy who, hmm, I'll just describe him as apparently he knows what he wants and he's intent on getting it. So he plants his boat at a marina in Miami as a dispute with the marina, he has it towed to a different marina, as a dispute with that marina, as it towed to a different marina, as a dispute with that marina, and he says, I'm leaving Miami, and he tows it for 80 miles up to West Palm, Florida, or in that area to the city of Riviera Beach, where he rents wharf space from uh, the city of uh, Riviera Beach, and he gets into a fight with them over his payment, over his $15,000 or $17,000 home. So they try to evict him in state court. He defends himself. They can't evict him. So some smart guy at the city of Riviera Beach, Florida, says, hey, I'm going to use that. This is a boat. This is a vessel. If it floats, it's a boat. It's been towed here. It's capable of transportation on the water. We're going to use the admiralty rules. We're going to sue the boat in federal court for a judge trial, and we're going to get a judgment against the boat, and the boat's not going to pay the judgment, and then we're going to seize the boat, and we're going to sell it for the judgment. So they sue in federal court. Lo and behold, they convince the judge, and Lozman's defending pro se does a nice job, but they convince the judge it's a vessel. If it floats, it's a boat. It's gone on four trips. The judge finds that he owes wharfage of about $3,000. He assesses prejudgment interest and a modest fine for maritime trespass. And uh, so there's about a $6,000 judgment against Lozman. Lozman then goes to gets a lawyer in Chicago to appeal to the 11th Circuit. Meantime, the city of Riviera Beach has this boat and they've seized it and they've taken it down to Miami. They have the marshal sell the boat because the boat doesn't have a checkbook. It can't write the check to pay the judgment. So they sell the boat. They get $4,000. Guess who buys the boat? The city of Riviera Beach. The city of Riviera Beach then takes the $4,000 in satisfaction of the judgment and destroys the boat so Lozman can't bother anybody else. But he's got this lawyer in Chicago, so Lozman gets his lawyer in Chicago, they go to the 11th Circuit, they appeal, they lose. So now Lozman says, I am not putting this down. This is now over $4,000, and you're into hundreds of thousands of dollars of legal expenses. So he flies out to California, and he convinces the Stanford you know, a constitutional law clinic, Supreme Court clinic, that this case is Supreme Court worthy. And the guy who runs that clinic, a guy named Jeffrey Fisher, very smart guy who just come off a case called involving the Exxon Valdez, where on behalf of the plaintiffs, he managed to hold on to a few hundred million dollars in punitive damages. We'll talk about that if we get time. Fisher says, I'm going to take this case and I'm going to establish, because there's a split in the circuits, and I'm going to establish it's not a vessel, the city of Riviera Beach, recognizing they're out of their debt. They go to the University of Texas and hire two of the smartest maritime lawyers in the United States, Dave, professors David Robertson and Michael Sturley. And so the case goes to the Supreme Court. Boat or no boat, what does the court do? That, who thinks the court says it's a vessel? Who thinks the court says it's not a vessel? In, the, in a bizarre split, seven to two, bizarre only because the two dissenters are Justices Sotomayor and Kennedy, who've never before been the only two dissenters together in a case, um, the court holds no boat. They focus on this language, is, was this capable of being used for transportation, ignoring the fact that it was used on three times for transportation. And they asked the question, 
Would a reasonable observer looking at the home's physical characteristics consider it designed to a practical degree for carrying people and things over water? And they focus on the windows and the doors, which are not portals like you see on a ship, but are just regular windows and doors. And that becomes, along with the fact that it's not self-propelled, that becomes a major basis of the decision. And you know, of course, who's going to win when instead of describing it as a houseboat, the Supreme Court, Justice Breyer writing, describes it as a floating home. Now the problem is nobody can make any sense of this test. This is the test that's set out. Would a reasonable observer looking at the structure's physical characteristics and activities consider it designed to a practical degree for carrying people and things on the water. Well, who's the reasonable observer? Is that the jury? Is this said uh, the jury looks at that? Or is there some outside reasonable observer we're going to look at? And what does this mean, physical characteristics and activities? How much do you have to transport? How frequently do you have to move? So they took what had been settled in Stewart versus Dutra construction, a clear, bright line test. Basically, if it floats, it's a boat, and they convert it back to a question about what would somebody say it is if they looked at it. Now, in the opinion, Justice Breyer is very quick to say this only applies in borderline cases. This case is out there. We understand it's at the boundary of what the definition is, and so you only use this reasonable observer test in borderline cases. Is that how it's going to be applied? Is it going to be applied only in floating home cases, borderline cases, non-self-propelled vessel cases, or is this the test for all structures? And here's why this is important. How many of you know what this is on the top left corner? It is a jack-up rig. How many of you know what this is in the bottom right-hand corner? It is a mobile offshore drilling unit known as a MODU. Who knows what the most famous MODU is in the world? The Deepwater Horizon. Tens of billions of dollars paid out because there was maritime jurisdiction because it was a vessel. Are these now vessels anymore? Are there Jones Act cases for people who are injured on offshore drilling jack-up rigs or mobile off offshore drilling units? Unknown, no case yet before the court. Would a reasonable observer consider those to be used for the transportation of people and equipment? So that's what's going on at the Supreme Court in January. Let me bring you down to the Fifth Circuit in February. This is the Hercules 251. It is a jack-up rig. At the time of the accident involved in the Barker case, it's jacked, its legs are down on the Outer Continental Shelf and it's jacked up 100 feet. Frank's casing is called out to run some large casing. In order to run the large casing down into the hole, Frank's casing has got to expand the size of the pollution pan, which is typically welded to the bottom uh, to the structure itself. In this case, there were straps that were holding the casing, the uh, pollution pan and were welded to the rig. The casing crew people assumed those straps were second uh, backup support. So they tell the guy down on the pollution pan, cut the straps. Well, he basically he cuts the straps, the pollution pan a pan plummets into the ocean and he's hanging on to a beam by his bare hands. His buddy, that was Mr. Broussard, Mr. Barker, is two feet away from the opening, turns around, looks down, see his buddy, sees his buddy hanging on, starts to reach for him, but cannot, the guy loses his grip, falls 100 feet to his death, striking a beam on the rig on the way down. So Barker sues. And Barker sues for negligent infliction of emotional distress and for bystander recovery. 
Well, under Texas law, there's no negligent infliction of emotional distress, and there's no bystander recovery. So the defense in the case is, this is not a vessel. Remember, jack-up rigs have been a vessel since the 1950s, based on a Fifth Circuit case called, case called Offshore Robeson versus Oil, uh, excuse me, Offshore Oil versus Robeson. He, uh, they claim it's not a vessel anymore. It's jacked down on the Outer Continental Shelf. It's the same as a fixed platform. And thus, Texas law applies, and Texas law doesn't allow recovery. And they end up in state, the suit's filed in state court, it gets removed to federal court, there's a removal battle about it, and Judge Melinda Harmon says, a jack-up rig attached to the seabed of the Outer Continental Shelf is not a vessel subject to maritime jurisdiction. Okay, they talk about activist judges. Okay, this is one judge, one federal district judge, who's now overruled 50 plus years of precedent, including Fifth Circuit cases above her. So the case gets, and she then throws the case out because if it's not a vessel, it's not in maritime jurisdiction. If it's not in maritime jurisdiction, the right to recover if you're in the zone of danger isn't implicated. Texas law applies. Mr. Barker, you don't have a cause of action. The Court of Appeals then this year, first in February, and then in um, they withdraw their February opinion and reissue an opinion in March. The February opinion basically supports the district court's opinion. There's a, there are motions filed, there's a blistering dissent by Judge Higginbotham, and, and I gotta say this, this case could not have ended up at a worse panel for the plaintiffs. The, the author of the majority and then the concurrence opinion was Edith Clement. Edith Clement was a former maritime defense lawyer. I think it was Jones Walker. Uh, I think she was at Jones Walker and her husband's at Phelps Dunbar. She's at Phelps Dunbar, her husband's at Jones Walker, one or the other. And um, she is on George Bush's short list when he points Alito to the Supreme Court. She was one of the other two. Patrick Higginbotham, who ends up dissenting, was the, after Robert Bork's nomination failed in 1986, was the Southern Senator's choice for Reagan to pick to replace Robert Bork. So you're not talking about a liberal crew here. The third judge was a former Baker Botts lawyer from Dallas who's a young lawyer and doesn't have much history. So initially the young lawyer, Judge Haynes, and Judge Clement say no admiralty jurisdiction, basically appear to be supporting the trial court's ruling. The case is reissued and Judge Clement issues a concurrence. She says there's no admiralty jurisdiction. She writes the majority, but this part is only joined in by one judge, Judge Clement. Her nickname is Joy. I suppose if my first name was Edith, I would want uh, a nickname. But calling her Joy, for those of you who've ever practiced before in Louisiana, is sort of like calling me blacky or red based on my hair color. So she says, there's no admiralty jurisdiction because although the jack-up rig is a vessel, it was used to install casing and in furtherance of the search for oil and gas, and that does not bear a substantial relationship to traditional maritime activity. That's in fact the law, every offshore case involving the search for oil and gas goes from being a Jones Act case to out of the system altogether. Judge Higginbotham issues this dissent in which he literally says this conclusion is ridiculous. Her approach defies our precedent. A jack-up rig is a vessel and the general character of the activity giving rise to the incident, which was vessel maintenance, showed it had a substantial relationship to traditional maritime activity. This was a ship, maritime jurisdiction applies. Mr. Barker was in the zone of danger. He has a cause of action and he should get a trial down in federal district court for his damages. Justice Haynes says, I don't care what law applies. I'm not making any decision on that. In my opinion, it doesn't make any difference. He doesn't recover under Texas law for the reasons we talked about, and he doesn't recover under federal law because he wasn't in the zone of danger. Being two feet away isn't the zone of danger. So 
the case is on what to make of this case is uncertain but you define you apply that with the second development which was an in bank decision about the coverage of the Longshore and Harbor Workers Compensation Act to back up there are two basically two types of maritime workers there are Jones Act seamen who are defined as masters or members of the crew of the vessel and there are people who are covered by the Longshore and Harbor Workers Compensation Act and they're not members of the crew of the vessel. They don't have a permanent attachment to an identifiable fleet of vessels. They're like the repair guys who go on many different ships to repair vessels, the longshoremen who go on many different ships to unload vessels. They have coverage under the Longshore and Harbor Workers Compensation Act. So, in, you get this case decided April 29th. It's an in bank case, New Orleans Depot Services versus Director. The Longshore and Harbor Workers Compensation Act says, okay, not only do we apply if you're injured on the water, we apply if you're injured in an adjoining area to the water and you're engaged in maritime employment, a situs requirement and a status requirement. And in a case called Winchester, decided in 1976 or 77, back when I was clerking for the Fifth Circuit, the, uh, the uh, 79, excuse me, or 80, when I was clerking for the Fifth Circuit, the court held you didn't have to be contiguous with the water. Adjoining meant, you know, sort of a gestalt adjoining, like the neighborhood adjoining, not adjacent to, exactly contiguous with. So they reconsidered this in a case where it's a hearing loss case and the details are unimportant but the injury occurred in the chef yard which is over to the right the water was 300 feet away and there was a bottling plant in between owned by a different company and the question became was this adjacent or not and the court holds no and that's really not important what is important is the fact that seven of the 15 judges signed on to a concurring opinion, missing one judge from becoming a majority. Guess who wrote that opinion? Edith Clement. And it says to meet the status test of the Longshore and Harbor Workers Compensation Act, you have to be engaged in maritime employment and maritime employment is limited to loading, unloading, repairing, or building a vessel. So what is the consequence of putting these two things together? Suppose Barker becomes the law in the Fifth Circuit and New Orleans Depot picks up one more vote for status. What's the status now of all these guys who are working on offshore drilling rigs? Well, if the rig's not a vessel anymore, they're no longer seamen. If the rig's not on the Outer Continental Shelf, if it's on the Outer Continental Shelf, the Longshore and Harbor Workers Act applies pursuant to the Outer Continental Shelf Lands Act. But if it's not on the Outer Continental Shelf, they're in state waters, they get Texas State Comp or Louisiana State Comp or Mississippi State Comp. Meaning they go from a case where they, a situation where they can sue their employer for their employer's negligence for hundreds of thousands, uncapped damages, to you get to recover two years of Texas, two years of compensation plus your percentage of disability. So that's this is these two cases. The the this is a periodic fight. Uh, about every ten years or so, it's rewaged in the Fifth Circuit. The court has ten conservative Republicans, five Democrats two vacancies. Edith Clement is just a little over 65 and this is her intended legacy to remove seamen, to remove offshore oil workers from the Jones Act and put them under state comp. Okay, punitive damages, just very briefly. For those of you who don't know, Seamen have three claims, basically, against their employer. Jones Act negligence, unseaworthiness, which is under the general maritime law, and maintenance and cure, which is a form of workers' comp. The employer is obligated to pay you uh, what you would, the equivalent of what, you, what it would cost you to replicate your housing and food on the vessel. 
if you were on land, and your medical care. So there was a case in 1990, a Supreme Court case, called Miles versus Aprex Marine, where the Supreme Court says there, no, there is no recovery for loss of society for non-dependent parents of a seaman in an unseaworthiness claim, which is a general maritime law claim. Based on that, courts around the United States interpreted the fact that you could not recover uh, for not these non-pecuniary damages to mean miles barred a recovery for punitive damages in every circumstance. So there are two recent Supreme Court cases that have cast doubt on all of those holdings. The first is Exxon Shipping versus Baker, which arose out of the, the Exxon Valdez oil spill and it allowed punitive damages under the general maritime law in an oil spill setting, and the second was Atlantic Sounding versus Townsend, a 5-4 decision written by Clarence Thomas, who turns out to be quite a good maritime judge uh, on the whole for the plaintiff's bar, which allowed punitive damages in maintenance and cure cases. So now courts around the United States, mostly at the lower level, are rethinking this question. Can you get punitive damages for claims under the general maritime law? And I've cited in my paper, the lower court citations that you see there are cases on both sides of the holding. The case to watch is McBride versus Estes Well Service. This is the, Luis, this is the uh, federal district site. It was argued in the Fifth Circuit on May 1st of 2013. So there should be a decision relatively soon about the extent in Texas, Louisiana, and Mississippi federal courts to which punitive damages are now available, and the Texas Supreme Court tends to follow the Fifth Circuit uh, in its holding. So this is going to tell you whether in the maritime law uh, punitive damages are likely available. Do you need me to cut off here, or do you need me to? Okay, I'll do whatever you tell me to do. Okay, two minutes. So maintenance and cure. Uh, we talked about it's the right of semen, food, lodging, and necessary medical services, and this is, you have three causes of action. If your employer, if the employer does not pay your client maintenance and cure, you can sue to get the maintenance and cure he's owed, usually somewhere around $30 a day plus his medical cost. If their failure to pay was unreasonable, you can get compensatory damages, including aggravation of the condition. And if it was arbitrary and capricious, you can get punitive damages and attorney's fees. So the Texas Supreme Court about a year ago in Weeks Marine versus Garza reversed a $2.5 million judgment for unreasonable failure to pay attorney's fees, saying that the plaintiff in that case did not show that the fail, excuse me, the failure to pay maintenance to cure holding that the, the plaintiff did not show that the failure to pay cure actually caused the pain and suffering. There's an excellent dissent by Justice Guzman, um, joined by two others, Judge, uh, Justice Medina and um, I can't remember the third. Anyway, they say there was some evidence of damages, not 2.5 million worth, but some evidence of damages, and it ought to go back for a remediator. But the key thing in there is that at the time the case was submitted, Townsend had not come out yet. So the trial court didn't allow a submission for punitive damages. The jury obviously wanted to punish Weeks Marine. Had there been a submission allowed for punitive damages, uh, we might have seen a different result. And in your paper, there is a case cited called Clausen versus Icicle Seafoods, Inc. And that is exactly how to handle a case, maintenance and cure, to get punitive damages. Uh, there was $35,000 in maintenance and cure owed, and the Washington Supreme Court upheld a $1.3 million verdict, and cert was just denied in that case this year, or I guess late last year, by the United States Supreme Court. So, sorry for moving fast. There was a lot of territory to cover. Bob, thanks again for hosting this, uh, this program. Rick, thank you, and again, uh, you have that paper, you have a maritime case, uh, probably the first thing you ought to do if you're not really familiar with this area is to call Rick Schechter.